My name is Monk Grow, and we're filming for the Hamilton College Jazz Archive today with Ruth Brisbane. Welcome to Hamilton. Great to be here. I, um, I so much enjoyed your, your singing today, and I was struck by, as, you're, as we talked beforehand, you have a, a normal sounding speaking voice. <laughs> But when you sang, man, really, that delivery was so powerful. Oh, is, thank you. Is, is that a conscious change for you? I have no idea uh, whether it's a conscious change. Um, I was not formally trained, so I guess what do they just call belting it out? Belting it out. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think today I mentioned that um, my mother sang, and um, she was a tiny lady, but she could belt it out, yes. What kind of songs would she have sung around the house? Around the house she loved um, uh, Bessie Smith and, and uh, uh, the heyday of her. Her era was um, the blues era. She was born in 1900. So in the 20s, she would have been in her 20s, a young woman. She was married, having her children, her brood, with my dad. And, but um, she loved the blues. In fact, she was, uh, when I started singing, she said, you've got to learn a blues. I didn't know a blues from you know, swing or whatever. I was used to listening it to um, people like um, Ella and um, Dinah. And well, Dinah was a good blues singer, but I didn't, I couldn't different differentiate between blues and swing. But and I wasn't doing any blues. But my mother forced me to learn blues. <laughs> yeah, that's very interesting. I I've read that some. African American households thought blues was the devil's music, or something like that. Uh huh. Well, people who are re religious. Okay. Yeah. Um, they didn't want it played and so forth. Okay. Yeah, listening to some of the old songs, they could be quite spicy. Yes. Um. So. For you, when she said you need to see, sing some blues, was part of that a blues song was the, the three lines with the two, first two being the same, and was that part of the definition of a blues? Or yes. What about feel? Uh, no, I believe the standard, standard blues. Yeah. Yes, standard blues. And so who did she direct you to to be a Blues model. Uh, who did she direct me to? She really did not direct me to any um, um, a model, but uh, I had a, a sister-in-law who was uh, as I said, divorced from my brother, but she took an interest in my um, singing. And she sent me to a vocal coach. And he was mainly um, blues and R&B. And mainly gave me the songs that he had written. <laughs> so, oh. still getting the standard blues, I had to work on getting that myself. I see. Yeah. And uh, when, you, when your mom listened to records, were they the uh, LPs? Uh, yes, they were. Uh, well, LPs hadn't even come out then. Okay. My house was always, uh, the house was always loaded with music because yeah. I have older brothers and sisters. Right. And um, my mother wanted to know where they were, so they were allowed to have company. So there was always music and people, uh, young people. So uh, whatever was the latest um, tunes. Right. were being played around okay. the house. But my mother could play the piano, whatever she heard. 
Oh, she's a person who could just hear it and then... And yes, right. She had an ear, yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, my, her father played um, coronet in, um, I guess, minstrel bands. Yeah. Oh, yeah? Yes. In fact, um, her mother was a singer also mm -hmm. and died on the, on the road. Um, and my mother was raised by some aunts. I see. But the music was in her, I guess, came from the room. And she imparted it to us. Okay. But my father had no no rhythm <laughs> and uh, couldn't call the tune. Really? <laughs> yes. How interesting. Right. Was, was he uh, mystified by your interest in, in uh, music and thinking of it as a career? How did he feel about that? Well, uh, he... Um, uh, didn't he died so he really didn't oh, okay. get to, to see me um, mm -hmm. fulfill my career I see. and um, and he was so busy working <laughs> uh, what did no. he do? he was a mechanic okay. yeah. yeah during the war uh, a, a longshoreman oh. mm -hmm. and you grew up in Brooklyn I grew up in Brooklyn yes okay. um, when was there a certain age, when you were a teenager or whatever, when you were really thinking, well, let, let me rephrase the question. Was there a point where you thought, I, I could really make a living being an entertainer? Uh, no, I was sort of like in limbo. Mm -hmm. um, I, it's, I sort of dropped into singing. As I said, my, my sister-in-law uh, sent me to a, a coach to get an act, AK, <laughs> uh -huh. and a um, very good piano player, and the um, old football player, I'm trying to think of his name, he had a booking agency on 125th Street. He sent me out to my first professional job by an agent. He was a former football player, Milt, you know him. I'm sorry, it will come to me. But, um... I don't know, Boston. Fritz Pollard. Fritz Pollard? Fritz Pollard. Okay. That was his name. He had an office on 125th Street. He sent me up to, um... Uh, New Haven, Connecticut. I remember working there and getting the um, train from his office at 125th. And while I was working in this little club, black club up in um, New Haven, who comes in but um, Lionel Hampton. And uh, he had me audition the next day um, at the theater he was working in. And I was so stupid. He said, stay and take the bus back with me. I want to talk to you about going into the Apollo with us. But I already had my train ticket, so I, I went home on the train. And when I went to the Apollo, his band boy stopped me and tried to make himself into something else. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. So I left. You know, no nonsense. But anyway, I missed that opportunity working with um, Lionel Hampton. But as I was, I had opportunities that I didn't even take. But I, I dropped into music. I'm uh -huh. trying to say, I, it was nothing that I planned. Yeah. Nothing that I planned. I, I, it seems like I've heard stories about Lionel Hampton's band boy somewhere else. All Some people might not even know what a band boy is. He wasn't a boy. He was an old, yes. older man. Okay. Uh -huh. Yeah. But I guess they uh, see that everything's running right, getting the musicians and yes. together. And, uh, you mentioned uh, in passing almost that when you went to, uh, was it New Haven, you said? Or, yes. Yeah, that it was a, a black club. Yes. Does that mean that white people couldn't go there or just didn't go 
Oh, they went. Okay. They went. But it was, but it was say, in a black-owned and black area. Okay. Yes. Right. And mm -hmm. was there dancing? Dancing, yes, and band, and right. MC, singer. Okay. And the usual, uh, <laughs> an exotic dancer. Oh. And, and you said the, that you went to this person to get an act together. Yes. Um, that's sort of a, a responsibility of a singer, right? If you want to work... You should have some kind of... You're supposed to have an act. Which I didn't realize at the time, an act. You get up and sing, you know. But I patterned and so forth, and then uh, he would correct me. No, no, I don't want that Sarah Vaughan e ending. I want a straight ending or something like that on a song. I see. And, blah, yeah. and um, I helped pick out a songs in sequence. Mm -hmm. And did he go through and um, get your keys for you? Oh, yes. Yes, and did you yes, yes, your keys. And um, he was very good for um, <clears throat> helping you with interpretation. Mm -hmm. yeah. And did you carry music with you? Like lead sheets to give to the... Uh, they would write up lead sheet, yes. Right. Yes, they would. I forgot about that, yes. Well, when you went to this, I, we're talking a lot about that one gig, but I'm, I'm sort of curious. Did you know any of the musicians before you got there? I know none of the <laughs> musicians, no. Wow. no. In that, fact, um, when you say that, um, I had a job in um, where Meharry Medical School is. I think it's Memphis, then. Is it Memphis? And um, a lot of the musicians were from the medical school. Oh, yeah. Excellent musicians. Yeah, so, uh, but they were in school. They were in a medical school, yeah. And after you did some of the singing, you, you how did you get into the, the theater end of things? Well, I wanted to audition for theater, but I heard that uh, for years, but I heard that you had to read music and I did not read music I didn't study piano or um, sight singing I started sight singing courses sometime and then I drop out because I had to um, go somewhere or out of town or whatever and um, finally uh, I got up enough nerve to audition for an off off Broadway show and it ended up uh, as a, uh, 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 getting a part in it it was like a hair and uh, we um, rehearsed up in Bucks County in a barn <laughs> and slept in the barn <laughs> so uh, and it did end up in New York at a um, uh, St. Clement's Theater, which is good for off-Broadway shows, it's still in existence. And in fact, some of the gentlemen I worked with up there, one was uh, in um, the opening of, and uh, for a long time, uh, in um, Lion King, which is still on Broadway. The Broadway Lion King and movies, another one. I was watching him in a movie the other night, one of the young men who was in the play um, that we were in, um, Don't Walk on the Clouds. Oh, and what, about what year would that have been? Uh, that was in the 60s, late 60s. Okay. Yes, late 60s. And, and you, you said your future husband came up and said, what are you doing in this barn? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> so shocked. <That's, laughs> How could you? <laughs> that's called paying dues, isn't it? I would say it yeah. was paying dues. Still had fun because yeah. you were with uh, musicians, singers, and you know, and getting this was getting a show from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. It's not coming into a show that's already running and getting a nice. part. And um, the directors and musicians were all hair in quotes type. <laughs> so, 
So we what does that mean to you? Hair in quotes type. Sort of like well, very uh, um, bohemian, okay. I would say, to, uh, to use a word, a phrase, bohemian, very, um, uh, that era when the um, liberation. Yes. Did they call it liberation? They, they did. Yeah, sure. yeah, yeah, yeah. In that, in that era, sure, the 60s. Yeah, the 60s, yes. yes. <laughs> Well, that was also an era of, uh, you know, great soul music and, and Motown. Did, did, did that music uh, catch your ear? Did you enjoy that kind of music? James Brown and uh, the soul I music. heard of James Brown once. I mean, not once, but I kept hearing about James Brown. I don't know why I hadn't heard him. But uh, he was at, at the Apollo Theater on 125th Street, so I made sure that I went to see him. And I thought he was hilarious, you know, especially with the coat and everything, the band, they all had a part doing something. And it was, it was a repetitive show, but he had a long line around. I said, what do I know? Boy, look at this. Uh -huh. But uh, the Motown sound uh, came to me kind of late. And um, I say that because I had two younger sisters that I used to take to uh, the um, Motown shows, Stevie Wonder and so forth, at the big theaters in Brooklyn and in Manhattan. And I could not get into it at the, at the time, yeah. And when you were in, um, you worked in Paris, was that with black, black and blue? Black and blue, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What was that like, being in Paris and getting paid to do what you like? Oh, it was wonderful, wonderful. I love Paris, and um, <coughs> as the song says, I love Paris. Uh -huh. <laughs> but um, and it was um, the winter time. I went over in December. The uh, one of the leads. She had work to do in New York, or, or concerts to do, and she wanted to go out and do the concerts and uh, come back, but they said, no, um, if you leave, you know, we're turning it over to someone else. So I auditioned, and um, I worked with so many wonderful musicians. The best part of working black and blue was like fiddle, Claude Fiddler, um, Bill Dillard, uh, I'm trying to think of some of the other names, the older guy, oh, the tap dancers, the older tap dancers, the copacetics. The copacetics? Yes, have you heard of them? No. They were older gentlemen who danced, tap danced, and they were like mentors to, if you mentioned the copacetics. Uh, in fact, um, Billy Strayhorn was, um, he didn't dance, he wrote, but he, he was part of that club, the copacetics. But the copacetics were a group of dancers. Uh, there is a movie out, um, it's an old movie, and they are all, they all have a part in it. I think Sammy Davis is in the movie. I can't think of the name. I saw it again recently on mm -hmm. TV. Mm -hmm. I, I'll do some research and, yeah. and write you and let you know okay. what it is. Were you a member of the, uh, the union, what did they call it? SAG. No, not SAG. Actors' Equity. Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. I was a member of Actors' Equity and also if you do commercials. Uh, you have to do join SAG. Okay. Yeah. So I did a few SAG commercials, which is Screen Actors Guild, Screen and Actors. Um, a few um, a few little um, bits on in movies. Okay. Um, you'll see me at the beginning of um, Cotton Club. Okay. With the um, Hines brothers for a flash. Yeah, <laughs> 
You're lucky you didn't end up on the cutting room floor, I guess. Oh, there was more of that, but it yes, did end up yes, on the, the cutting room floor, happened. yeah. Uh -huh. Do you recall what kind of commer what commercials you did? I did a Hershey's commercial, um, a uh, automobile. I'm trying to think of which one it was. I think it was Chevrolet. Mm -hmm. That was radio, though. And um, I'm trying to think of some of the other commercials I did. Can't think. No. Yeah. What well, What is that like? Do they usually you usually get the work done in one day? Usually it's one day, yes. Yeah. Uh, you go in an audition and then um, you might have come come back for wardrobe and fittings and so right. forth. And then you shoot, yes. Yeah, and then they give you a little script and it's usually a 30 second commercial. Uh, or, yes, yeah. yes, holding the product, bounty or whatever. Yes. yes. I think I did do a bounty. Yeah. I'll look for it. <laughs> <laughs> that was long ago, yes. <laughs> in the 70s. Yes. Do you remember what those things would pay, if you don't mind me asking? Very, very well. Yes, okay. Very, if, if it goes national, um, excuse me. Okay. I, uh, I remember the key word was national. Yes, if it goes national, it pays very, very well. And do you keep getting... <laughs> residuals until they yeah. take it off, <clears throat> yes. Take it off. And sometimes they want to renew it, so you get another stipend when they want to renew That's it nice. for us. Yeah. That's probably pretty neat when a, a check shows up for something you did all those years ago. Yes, all yes. <laughs> yeah. How did you get um, hooked up with Dr. Valmer in the Carnival Blues and Jazz Band? Uh, I was doing a um, show with a gentleman named Terry Waldo, who specializes in ragtime music and all the old tunes. And he uh, studied with U.B. Blake. Yes, and I, I think he worked on some of his music, categorizing it and, or cataloging it. Mm -hmm. And uh, Terry uh, was doing a show out in uh, where Shea Stadium was. Um, the old uh, uh, World's Fair was there. One of the old World's Fair, the last, last one, I think. And it was called Shake That Thing. <laughs> Why do I have to be in shows like Shake That Thing and One More Time? <laughs> but. Uh, so uh, I had a, um, was part of the show, and uh, Al saw me in that and um, called me to um, substitute for his singer, who um, was quite busy. Uh, you know, she loved to go out and do other things, yes. and she, she stayed busy. So uh, I, they were downtown in the village at... Um, uh, a club, and I worked there a few times with that, uh, for Al, uh, Al's band. Yeah. Al may not have even been there, so that's how I started working with him. Right. And is, am, I, am I right in guessing that there was probably no rehearsal? No. Just... No rehearsal. Just go and... Hit it. <laughs> Hit it. Yeah, but... Uh, so a singer... If a, if a young singer was watching this interview later on, what do you say to that person? How do they prepare to do that kind of thing? Where they just, they get a call to show up at some club and be ready to work. Well, you have to have uh, um, your keys or your lead sheet. As you said, you reminded me about the lead sheets that ha that are written out in your key, mm -hmm. and hopefully the <laughs> piano player reads or whomsoever the leads. Yeah. Uh, and um, try to get out there and work as much as you can yeah. to get some kind of experience, so you'll be ready to um, to. Uh, 
to uh, singing along with people who work in bigger venues and or can be seen. Was there an experience when you were young that you recall where you really got thrown in front of a, an audience and you had to really suck it up? And I think you mentioned something about your... I was not ready. I was telling you all my mother was active in the community and um, uh, at BAM, which is very famous now, Brooklyn Academy of Music. Every year, the ladies' club, whatever it was, um, Amsterdam News, which is a black newspaper, I think, Fresh Air Fund, um, benefit. They would cook magnificent food, go out and get cases of beer and booze for backstage um, musicians who donated the time. The whole Apollo would come over. I guess they must have heard about the good food and, <laughs> and booze. And um, UB Blake and um, uh, was uh, conducting and Noble Sissel. And my mother made me get up and sing. I was not ready, not ready at all. And how old were you then? Oh, maybe about 15. Mm -hmm. I would think about 15, if that. Yeah, at least about 14 or 15. Do you remember what you sang? I think I sang a song that you mentioned, All of Me. Oh. Yes. Uh-huh. <laughs> well, it's funny when you said you, you weren't ready, that's what you said. You, you might wonder, well, when would you have been ready? You know, in your, in your own mind. In my own mind, uh, I had never been sent to a coach or gotten didn't realize the significance of having your lead sheets or your keys, yeah. things like that. Okay. So it took a good while before I got to a coach or um, someone to um, assist me with, um, or to go to someone to right. pay them to get an act. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. What did you usually make on a I'm just curious about the pay musicians got and how it, if you lined it up with what people were making on an hourly wage, you know, and the cost of living and that whole thing, what was an average gig paying for you? Well, when I started singing, the average gig was like about $15 a night at the local venues. Mm -hmm. And I'm very vague about how uh, that uh, added up in that time, you know. But I can remember making fifteen dollars a night, and I think that wasn't too bad because I think a full-time job was paying something like twenty, twenty-five dollars a a week. Say for a uh, secretary. Yes. Wow. So 15 a night wasn't too bad? It wasn't too bad. Yeah. Right? You worked two nights on the weekend, that was $30. <laughs> <laughs> did, did you have to learn how to handle yourself um, with some of the clientele or even your fellow musicians, you know, as a, as a young woman? And I forget the, the name you were calling. You were trying to call some of these clubs, but you were... Oh, some, some of them were kind of rough. Bucket of blood, that's bucket what, the blood. bucket of blood. Yeah. Well, I stayed very uptight. I started off some in some very nice ones, but a couple of times some people call, like an MC, and, and so, Ruth, come work with me in this club. Oh, oh, my God, that's a bucket of blood. So I had this sort of... Um, attitude um, or you know a very skittish and nervous and then one night I what relaxed 
relaxed me as I went in one night to a club I did not want to work in and there was this gorgeous woman at the door collecting money. Elegant, dressed gorgeous, she became one of my best friends. And that relaxed me so I was no longer afraid to work in any, you know, any bucket of blood. But how I handled myself, I was always a little nervous and a little, you know, my, my mother put the fear of everybody in us, you know, um, don't do this, don't do that. My sister-in-law, who was the um, exotic dancer, don't do this, don't do that, stand this way, blah, blah. So I was always a little uptight, but I could, I could handle myself very well. Yeah. I, I liked your description of a, a typical act. The full act in a club would consist of a, the exotic dancer, the MC, and the MC, yeah. and a comedian. And the band. Uh, yeah. Uh, the, the MC, no. The oh. MC was the comedian, okay. the exotic dancer, and the singer, and of course the house band. Yeah. And, uh, like in Brooklyn, there was the as my, when my uh, sister-in-law called me for the baby grand in Brooklyn, Nipsey Russell was the MC. Nipsey Russell. Yes, yeah. and he was quite famous. He was quite famous there, and a wonderful MC. Mm -hmm. I was afraid for him to even say "boo" to me, like "hello," or "this is Nipsey Russell." Yeah. So that's what I mean about being uptight. But um, my sister in law always said, You don't do anything but sing for a living. You have a wonderful voice and you sing and don't take any nonsense from anybody. And I never, and my mother instilled that in me too, so I never did. Yeah. I walk out, you know. You go to an agent's office who's that's hanky panky. Goodbye. <laughs> and you don't even say goodbye. <laughs> And what would um, define an exotic dancer? What made them exotic? Well, I'm <laughs> uh, their costumes. Yeah. It was um, uh, in quote stripping, yeah. you know, but uh, they had an act. Yeah. Um, was it really hilarious? And I'd love to see um, on uh, Sanford and Son. Uh, his uh, cousin, or um, she used to be a uh, exotic dancer. She was very funny, the woman. I can't think of her name. And I heard that she used a snake. Yes, she was a snake charmer. That was her uh, hook. My sister-in-law stripped from a... Um, costume that was, and music too, the last time I saw Paris. And she came out in a couture suit, and um, from there she stripped, which she was a gorgeous woman, beautiful, and very classy. She had a very classy act. <laughs> was it, um, did you get to sing before or after the stripper? Uh, the dad. stripper was usually on in the middle, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the MC and comedian would come out and tell the jokes, at the beginning and then more. And then I think the singer usually was last. Oh. And how many shows did you do a night? Oh, at least three or four. Yeah. So the hours four. typically would have been? From uh, about 10 to 4 in the morning. From 10 p.m. to 4 in the morning, yes. Wow. And New York, they close at 3, so it would be from 10 to 3 a.m. I see. And how would you get home after that? Believe it or not, I'm amazed. When I worked in Manhattan, all the way up at 125th, I took the subway home. You can't, I, I can't imagine doing that today. Or, you know, um, 20 years ago, I couldn't imagine doing that. And I had six blocks to walk from the um, subway in Brooklyn. 
I remember falling asleep on the train one night and Diane Carroll's father woke me up. He was a conductor on the A train. And that's the train I took home to Brooklyn. And he woke me up and he said, I believe you get off soon. I will thank that man forever. Because I never went past the hundred, my stop, which was Utica Avenue in Brooklyn. I would really would have been um, upset, <laughs> more than upset. Right. But my mother used to say, if you ever feel that you have to take a cab home, even if you don't have the money, you'll find the money in the house somewhere right. to pay the cab driver. I see. Yeah. And yeah, so those are some pretty late nights. You yeah. Watch the sun come up almost. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Now, did you ever be? Were you ever playing clubs and then having a day job at the same time? Yes, yes. Oh, must have been hard. It was, and uh, my supervisor said you have to make a choice. Mm -hmm. I was working in Kings County Hospital in Brooklyn, the student nurses department, typing up the tests and um, lectures and things. And uh, I was doing a lot of work, and so uh, she said, it's not good for your health, and so forth. And she was giving me good advice. Yeah. Uh, I don't think it was because of um, my uh, capabilities at, at work, but she had had t uh, tuberculosis. I mean, years ago, we know that tuberculosis was a big killer. Yeah. And she, she was from Pennsylvania. She was head of, the, um, the, of um, the little office I was in. And I think she was just giving me good advice. And then I had some jobs that I was often out of town and, you know, so. I ended in my regu resignation. <laughs> yeah. This is a hard question, but I'll, I'll try it. Um, do you recall any of the worst gigs you ever had to play? I'm trying to think. I think after, even if they're the worst, after you can laugh about it. So they turn into something that's not the worst gig. Yes. I know that sometimes on um, New Year's Eve can be some of the worst gigs. I remember working in a club where there was nowhere to sl uh, it's not sleep, um, sit. Mm -hmm. I had to sit on the bench with the with the organ player, with the organ organist, and uh, there wasn't anywhere for the um, mm -hmm. performers to, to yeah. sit. Yeah, singers. Okay. How about how about the best gigs? A couple of the best gigs you've ever done. Well, as I said, I loved. Uh, Working in South Pacific for some reason, oh, yes. I love South Pacific. When Bloody Mary, and of course the, the show had a, a, a message, so that was even a, more of a plus. Right. Hey, what was the song that you got to sing as Bloody Mary? There was two happy, wait, happy, happy talk. talking, talking, happy talk, and then. Um, the, my favorite one was, most people live on a lonely island, lost in the middle of a foggy sea. Most people long for another island, one where they wish and long to be. Malihai may call you. Yeah, I love that song. Maybe that's why I loved it so much. I love Valley High. It was magical. And big cast. It was huge cast. And it was fun. But I'm sure I've had better gigs, but I've had more and as much fun. But that, that one always resonates with me. And that was, was that, what theater was that in? We did a Midwest tour of it. But ended up in a a dinner theater in Nanuet. Nanuet? Nanuet, New York. Oh. But we started out in um, Muni Opera, um, 
in uh, which was outdoors sometime outdoors and um, I remember the big trees huge stage and uh, you open your mouth and <laughs> the, the, the bugs were flying in it all of us in the cast I think uh, Giorgio Tazzi and um, uh, Florence Henderson were, and we all were complaining about the bugs. <laughs> then we went to Indianapolis and um, I think um, Starlight Theater, another Starlight Theater. Yeah, and, but we ended up in Nanuet, New York. Okay. With Julius LaRosa? Julius, but that was a different one. Now, you, you said the Muni Opera. Muni Opera, it's uh, a huge, uh, uh, I guess it's from Municipal Opera. It's, uh, I'm not sure if it's run by the city of um, St. Louis. St. Oh. Louis, yes. Right. And these huge, it's a huge venue mm. in a park. And, and you probably would have had a fairly large pit orchestra. Oh, those yes. Days. Oh, yes. that was great. Yes. Yes. Those, those, those groups have shrunk now, unfortunately, for a lot of the touring acts. Mm -hmm. you know. yeah. And have you traveled overseas with the Harlem Blues and Jazz Band? Oh, yes. Yes. We've been... Not just Sweden, practically every year. Norway, another magical job was in, um, oh God, it's a tourist place in um, uh, Denmark. Oh, what is it? Sorry, the memory. But that was magical. Beautiful little theater in a park. What is the name? Oh, please forgive me. I don't want to tell you what it is. <laughs> Early Alzheimer's. Well, do the, the audiences, are they different overseas? I think they are different. I would think they, I would say they're different. Very receptive. Um, not only did we've been to Russia and um, several times traveled all over from one end to the other which Russia is huge uh, from the you know east coast to the west coast you could look over and see China <laughs> and from Vladivostok or whatever uh -huh. it is <laughs> wow. but uh, I'm still trying to think of the, the name of that theater um, so we got Tivoli Gardens, I think it is Tivoli oh. Gardens. No, Tivoli is in England, right? Mm. Escapes me too. Do you get to go? Yeah, but I have to pay my way, right? He's been a few times, yeah. Yeah, it's been uh, lovely working with the um, Harlem Blues and Jazz Band, yeah. The last place we went was um, uh, Macau, that was so rewarding that I, we had such a wonderful time. And, um, outside, of, we had to land in our, Hong Kong and um, then take a ferry to Macau. Wow. Lovely, lovely place, yeah, had a wonderful time. It must be hard to uh, decide what you have to charge in order to pay everybody and pay all those plane tickets and all that. It's yes, a lot of, yes. It's, yeah. a lot of it's a lot of money for the people to put out who bring us over there. Yes. Yes. So they really. Oh, and another place, St. Petersburg. Oh, my God. Is that a beautiful city in Russia? And we've done in theater there and outside um, in a park. It was really wonderful. Yeah. Have you ever um, done any attempts at writing your own songs? Yes, I have. And uh, I think I've been lazy. In fact, um, 
I was just asked if I knew anybody who writes lyrics. I could attempt to write some more. I see. Yes. Put my mind to it. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if a young singer comes to you these days and says, uh, you know, I want to do some of the stuff that you did in your career, do you have any advice for them? <laughs> I certainly would. I would advise them to be um, more on top of um, uh, of um, what they are aiming for or their goals. And um, I've I've had um, I wouldn't say a lack of days of latitude, but. I knew I could always stop and go and work as a secretary and, and make a good I've worked at the U United Nations. Uh, when I went up to um, the barn <laughs> in the first play I went into, I was working at William Morris Agency giving a very, very good salary. So I've been, you know, like on the fence too mm -hmm. much, too much on the fence. I see. I think straight ahead. Um, music would be better concentrating on your right. music. Yes. Be very directed. In be very direct at what you are yeah. aiming for. Now, your husband says that you said he plays a lot of jazz in the house. Yes. And what kind, what is the, what's your favorite era? His favorite era? Or well, mine? His. His favorite era is, um, he loves Duke Ellington, Monk, Coltrane, uh, some of them, um, when we first got married, he had bought a, an album, Bitches Brew, <laughs> and I would be cooking. I said, why have you got on Bitches Brew again? I would stop. He would turn me into a... But you know, now I like when I hear it played on the radio. I say, oh, that's bitches, bro. And I love it. <laughs> and he loves crazy people like, um, or Ned Coleman. Some, uh, in, uh, some of the uh, uh, CDs he has, uh, oh, please, I don't want to hear that again. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I have some of those memories. The first, the first Coltrane album I bought. I was unaware of what he was doing. It was called Home, and it was very, very progressive. And uh, my ears were not ready for it yet. <laughs> Home. Oh, you'll have to play that one for me, Bill. <laughs> yeah. Well, and what do you like to listen to? What do I like to listen to? Well, um, I love, I love, um, I want to concentrate more on... Um, uh, Brazilian music, love sambas and uh, that uh, type music, and um, as I said, I still enjoy the older singers. Mm -hmm. When I say older, the ones I grew up with, yes. listening to Ella and Sarah and. You play them, and they you say, "Well, this is the way they were singing then." And are you, yeah. are you consider yourself a scat singer? No, but I do scat. Yes, I do scat. Right. And uh, I have to get in the mood for it. Let's scat around the house and stuff. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. What's your next big? Uh, you guys are going. To Europe, I think, or am I maybe confused? Uh, yes, they're going to Europe. Or I'm not going okay. because I'm recuperating yes. from uh, my back surgery. Right. So uh, it would be a stretch for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I love the way you sang the gospel songs oh. earlier today. They're very powerful. Thank you. Thank you. I'm looking forward to your performance tonight. You have any, any, just quickly, any um, people you've been able to play with over the years or meet that you'd like to say anything about? 
Well, uh, the only thing I'd like to say is um, people I've met and um, could have worked for and didn't take the opportunity, mm -hmm. like working with um, Lionel Hampton's band. Yeah. Um, I had um, an audition with Duke and got cold feet. <laughs> they were recording oh. um, his um Someone who was working with said, come up to the recording. I came, but I left. I got cold feet. Oh. That's somebody I would, want, would really have loved to work with. And uh, I think I got overwhelmed by the thought of Duke Ellington. You know? really? <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I appreciate your time today. Thank any you very time. Much for the conversation. If you like an addendum? Yes. <laughs> Let okay. me know. I look forward to your performance tonight. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Take my advice. Hug them in the morning. Squeeze them late at night. Fill them full of love and treat that good man right. Cause a good man.